pick it up. I won an amateur championship as a schoolboy. Well, I did and I was nearly 16, 15 and a half. Very tiny, very skinny, but I won a, uh, an amateur championship, which is the best of the boxers in, uh, at my weight in all the country. I thought that was, that was quite useful. And then I went on, I boxed as a middleweight as I grew older. Um, and in one, uh, in one instance, uh, I was working on the, the first film I made, uh, which was Odd Man Out, the first film I worked on as a stand-in to James Mason. Now, uh, while we were working, which was mostly in the back streets of the East End of London, um, location supposedly uh, Belfast, but uh, I was still training amateur boxing at the, at the same time I was doing the standing in. And uh, I was due to fight in the finals of, a, uh, of the middleweight amateur championships, I believe at Wembley. And my uncle, who was very enthusiastic, had gone there expecting to see me. And of course, I was working late on this film and I couldn't give up uh, the film work. Uh, so I didn't turn up for this. And my uncle said, you would have met a very good fighter. He said the, the, the guy, the middleweight uh, that won the ABA championship was named uh, Turpin. He said, I, I think he'll be a world champion one day. And of course, that was the guy I would have met, and he was a world champion. He beat Sugar Ray Robinson for the World Middleweight Championship a few years later. So I thought maybe it's just as well that I carried on working on Odd Man Out and not going to Wembley. <laughs> We went to Tobago, piles of logs rolling down the hill, rolling down the hill, crushing us, knocking us, knocking us about. But uh, yeah, it was quite pleasant. Thirteen altogether I worked on, thirteen Bond pictures. I doubled for Sean Connery driving the Aston Martin, crashing into a wall. So they built this set on the back lot out of polystyrene and Bob Simmons was to drive the car as Sean Connery. But Bob Simmons uh, was a daring chap but a terrible driver. <laughs> and he just w went into the set and instead of sort of stopping, well you couldn't very well stop too easily on a polystyrene set because it would probably fall down anyway. But he drove right the way through and the whole lot just went up in the air in like snowflakes. So they thought, well, better get George to do it and we'll drive it between the two stages uh, and uh, into the brick wall. But we've built a force wall in front of the brick wall about uh, three, maybe four feet, no, I think it was about three feet in front of a, the brick wall of the stage. Uh, and the phony wall I was to go into, I could only crash into the wall a certain distance because uh, odd job and Goldfinger come behind, they're, they're following Bond, pulling the Aston Martin, uh, and they stop and walk around after the crash, pull the door open, and Sean Connery Bond falls out. I had a, a part in there as one of the, the bandits, one of the, the villains chasing Bond, and I think I was the only one that ever shot Bond. 
a guy who's drunk staggers about with a bottle of rum and he puts the rum through the car door through with the window and uh, Bond grabs hold of the thing and sticks it into somebody who's just lighting a cigarette, pours it onto there, onto me and I catch fire. I dive out of the car to be safe and Sean Connery jumps out of the car to get away. And while I'm on the floor, I drew, a, drew my gun and shoot Connery in the leg. And uh, so the next scene you see is, is us villains going through this junk canoe through the streets and the bands, following the trail of blood that coming from Sean Connery's leg. Every stunt man that we could find we to get 120, 120 stunt men. And of course, there weren't 120 film stunt men around. But we knew amongst the extras, having worked for several years by then in the film business, that we knew so many of the extras that either had been stunt men or there were useful extras that they, they could climb a rope or, or rush in. Yeah, so we knew the ones that uh, were, were not, they were what we call semi stunts. <laughs> they weren't stunt men, but they could knock themselves about a bit. And you had to walk through the girders from the top, which was a bit of a stunt in itself, actually getting to the spot where you attach yourself onto the rope. Because if you'd fallen while you're walking through the girders onto the 120 feet, you're dead, aren't you? But uh, the ro you, you have to get onto the rope, fix yourself onto the rope. You either abseil down there uh, with the abseiling equipment, or um, you can, we had uh, rubber hoses which were split down the length and we set the rubber hose on because you couldn't slide down ordinarily because you'd just yeah. tear, all the, tear all the skin off your hands. Um, and we practiced on shorter lengths of rope to start with and actually judging the speed. And we found that if you went down too fast, you, you couldn't break. You could break by clenching the, the, the hose on the rope and that would slow you down or, or almost stop you. It didn't stop you dead, obviously. Uh, but you had to you had to be able to do that i've been practicing at the gymnasium for a long time and i found i could go up like a monkey up on the rope like a circus performer hand over hand and come down firing a tommy gun with one hand and holding the 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 uh, pipe with the the rubber hose with the other hand and i was able to slow myself down enough by gripping and firing a tommy gun at the same time I was doubling for um, Dick Van Dyke with a rocket on my back, <laughs> going up a slope. He was, he was uh, going to take off. He had some of these false wings and he was going to take off on this ramp. So that was my first job, was doub that. doubling for him, <laughs> flying up the ramp and it stops at the top, thank goodness. And uh, then I doubled for Lionel Jeffries in his flying laboratory, which is a flying lavatory. And I was singing this, singing this posh, posh traveling life. The traveling life for me, and I knew all the words and the songs. Oh, the posh, the posh, the traveling life, the traveling life for me. First a cabin, a captain's table, regal company. Pardon the dust of the upper crust. Fetch us a cup of tea. Pour out, starve it out, posh with a capital P. So it was covered mostly with close-ups of Lionel Jeffries singing the song anyway. But uh, I was standing by the tank when that crashed into the water and Lionel, Lionel Jeffries was in it as it zoomed over. I mean, it was fixed on a, a, a cable so that it came at the right angle and hit the water in the right place. But unfortunately for, for Lionel, the door flew open and he was just about to fall into the water when I dived in off a rostrum and pushed him back in the thing and shut the door. <laughs> And he bought me a bottle of champagne afterwards and said, thank goodness, George, he said, you saved my life. He was so terrified of falling into water. I took a dozen stuntmen out there with me up in the mountains in the in Neuron in Switzerland. And uh, I took 
uh, about four other people, maybe more, that could double for Lazenby. I was, uh, I was doubling for him as well as arranging the action. Uh, there was Vic, uh, and there were all, oh, there were about three others that I could use. You know, they weren't, weren't there. But on one, one, one occasion, I, I injured myself, and get another man can get into the uniform immediately and step in, and that's how we work. We weren't allowed to touch the skis. Only the double, only the double were doing the skiing, mostly uh, the Swiss, the, to the top skiers, you know, you, you couldn't have someone that was only semi-skilled at skiing, it had to be the best skiers. I had a chance to go on down on the Bob Run, we, we had to yeah. do that. It was a fire scene where Sean Connery sets fire to one of the villains. There was a pair of villains in it. Uh, it's on the on the ship, and he arrives with a shish kebab as the American actor, and the guy uh, with a shish kebab. So he goes up in flames. So to double for him, they made a, a replica of his face. So I had to go to the plasterer's shop where they make a full a moulding of your face. The mask fit typically are made out of material. It was fireproof, but it was um, a moulded on this, on this thing I did in the plaster shop with a, a, a likeness of this actor on the outside of the mask. And I could see through two holes in the eyes. And that was to make me, my face fireproof virtually. And I wore some fireproof gear on my clothes. Uh, and just did this scene where they set fire to me up in the air flames all over the place and diving over the side of the ship. Crazy work. Chasing Roger Moore in the Lotus, and I was leaning out of one window firing shots at it, and there was the other stuntman, Jack Cooper, on the other side firing out of that window, uh, and it finishes up, we crash the car, and it goes through the roof of uh, some peasant's house with uh, Jaws, who was in our car. We didn't walk out of the, of, the, of the house when it was shattered. It went right through the roof of this house. Uh, Jaws walked out quite uninjured, unperturbed. I know, don't tell me. Crazy scenes. And I did, did another one, uh, doubling for Roger Moore in the Lotus, where I actually overtook, I was being chased, Roger Moore was being chased 
by a motorcyclist with a rocket and he fires, fires the rocket and at the Lotus and now by, by this time Roger Moore isn't in the car, I'm in the car uh, and as he overtakes this great uh, truck another one is coming towards him so it looks as if he's going to have a head-on crash and he just gets in between the two lorries but that had to be worked out perfectly so that each lorry started from a set mark and I had to go at a, what I had to guess was a set speed from a stop mark uh, and work it out pace, pace the thing out and time it but if it had gone wrong and I'd have been caught between these two lorries it was only a fiberglass body and uh, that would have been curtains feathers and he still can't fly. I carried on being a, a high fall man, coming from the window, uh, going out through the window, through the skylight underneath of another building, uh, through a table, there was a table set underneath with an Italian family, bowls of spaghetti and wine, and they were all stunt people, boys and girls, sitting around the, uh, around the table. Uh, and I was to come through the window, through the skylight, through the table where they were sitting, and through the floor to the room underneath where there was an elderly couple sitting watching television, and to go through the mat, through the, the floor in front of them. Now, that was a, a difficult one to work out. And uh, I tried it without the skylight in position where the set was just being built from the, from the takeoff point. Um, and I found that my feet actually hit one edge of it which meant uh, moving the skylight, rebuilding that part of the set virtually, moving it back about 18 inches that would enable me to get through this tiny spot which is about the size of a dug grave, the kind of size they dig in cemeteries, which wasn't very big, uh, and to get through that without really being able to see it because I had to go through the table that was set with the people sitting around it. Um, anyway, that was all right, except the, the uh, the American stuntman who was in charge of all the stunts wasn't too pleased. He thought maybe I couldn't do the job when I was saying I wanted this done and the set moved a bit. Uh, and uh, when it, it was all ready, I found that the thing had been set back 18 inches, the, the breakaway glass had been put in the skylight, and I whizzed through the window, down through the skylight, hit the table with all the bottles and gl uh, just in between a couple of large bottles of wine, through the table, through the gap in the floor to the room underneath and it worked perfectly, one take. the wall <laughs> like a picture hung on the wall with a desk in front of me and an office chair and it was all fixed onto the wall so that Superman could climb up the building which was laid flat obviously so the building was flat and he could crawl up it uh, on his stomach help with a aid of gravity holding him onto the building and I was stuck on the wall with a force of gravity trying to pull me off the wall through me up through my office chair and desk and onto the floor and it was just a strange setup. It was, I think the most difficult part was actually getting into it, to climb up a, a long ladder to get into this seat that was stuck on the wall with a desk stuck in front of it. The strangest job. And then I, I, I remember seeing uh, Superman go up the side by the window and, and I, I look around and think, no, it can't be true. Your eyes open. 
only can see me through the night. We went to Corfu and we were on a on a on a yacht there where I played the villain again, threatening the girl, the heroine with a knife, and I, I was I was pulled overboard and eaten by a shark. Oh that was nice. <laughs> I was on the Pink Panther and we were doing some stuff in in Pinewood Studio and I was training and I was being thrown in, uh, in, in over somebody's shoulder in actual fact and landing flat on my back. I call it the Irish whip, where the wrestlers often do it. And it, it, it entails grabbing your opponent's arm, stopping a blow, grabbing his arm, swinging his arm, and he does a somersault, whack, and lands flat on your back. Now, to do that properly, so that you don't really hurt yourself, you break the fall with your feet and your hands. Uh, but, but it's such an enormous crash, it looks as if you've broken your back. Now, I was training hard at this time, uh, on, the, on the punch ball as well, and I suddenly thought to myself, how old am I? It worked out I was 61 years of age and I was still doing this Irish whip onto a hard floor at the age of 61 and, and training to keep myself fit, punching the bag. We uh, went to Hong Kong to do the rest of the picture with the Pink Panther in Hong Kong and in a hotel, a very nice hotel in Hong Kong, and they had a bar, Dickens Bar it was called, Dickens. Um, it was, let me see, a very nice bar and there was some guy in there drinking that was causing a bit of trouble. And he bumped into the girl next to him and uh, he said, I said, well, you've, you've just knocked her. What, what, do you, what, what to, to you, uh, do you want trouble? So being a peacemaker, I said, no, 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 don't want any trouble. I mean, you mustn't get a reputation as a, a hooligan, you know. And I've only ever had two fisticuffs outside the boxing ring in my life. And this was one of them. And anyway, I backed out of that. I didn't want to know. And he turned around, he had another drink, and he was still boistering about, and he bumped into this same girl again, who went like that with her elbow into his ribs. And he immediately turned around. He thought, well, I've got an easy one here. He doesn't want to fight, you see. So, and so, and I, was, I was watching him. I thought something was in his mind. I sensed it. And I had my pint glass in my hand. And as he turned around, he drew back this big John Wayne fist to thump me, and he, I was too quick, I went, bang, hit him on the chin. <laughs> he just flopped over the bar, not over the bar, but onto the, onto the top of the bar, semi-conscious, and I uh, just grabbed hold of him and walked him out and said, you better go home, go on, hop it. And I thought to myself, well, I'm 61, I don't want to have any fights, and here I am. <laughs> 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 I've had a fight at 61 years of age.